Hello, this is Professor Paul, and this is the second Writing About Literature uh, short lecture. And this one's about using textual evidence and writing paragraphs in a literature analysis. First, let's just begin with an overview of a very simple way to think about paragraphs and how you structure a paragraph, and that's uh, the pie format, where you have a point, an illustration, and an explanation. So the point is the idea that you're trying to prove or demonstrate or express to your readers, and it's one point for a particular paragraph. So what's the idea about the poem or about the piece of literature that you're interpreting that you're trying to express? The illustration would be the specific concrete evidence that supports your point and shows your idea in action in the text. So when you're writing about literature, this is usually going to be an actual quotation from the text itself. And finally, you have an explanation. That is the logic and or reasoning that connects your evidence to the point, to the idea that you're trying to prove. So you have a point, you have the illustration of that point in an action, and then you explain the illustration, show how it works, show how it supports your idea. Now, I'm going to go about this process in, in perhaps a slightly uh, unusual way, a different order than you might normally proceed or, or uh, have expected. Uh, but that's in order to take you through some different cognitive processes to make sure that we're going through all the steps that you need to go through in composing and writing uh, about literature. So I've chosen as the uh, our sample text, the text that we're going to be writing about, the poem A River Merchant's Wife, a letter by Ezra Pound. And so I've chosen two pieces of evidence, two illustrations from the text that um, we're going to use for to, to make some point, to make uh, a point in our interpretation of the poem. And that's these two lines that refer to the gate. While my hair was still cut straight across my forehead, I played about the front gate pulling flowers, lines one through two, and by the gate now the moss is grown, the different mosses too deep to clear them away, lines 20 to 21. So let's assume that we're writing a paper about this poem, and for some, for whatever reason, we've decided that we want to use these two lines, or these two uh, mentions of the gate, in order to make some case, in order to uh, make our argument, advance our interpretation of the poem. The first step is just to identify the context, make sure we understand for ourselves what is actually going on in the moments when these lines are uttered. What's the situation? Um, and this is important because without the context, without understanding the context, it's very easy to misinterpret or misread uh, a quotation. So in lines one to two, what is going on there? This is when the speaker is talking about the first meeting between her and her husband when they were both children. And the second uh, quotation, lines 20, 21, this is near the end of the letter, and this is where the speaker is describing how things have changed uh, in her husband's absence, in particular how the gate has transformed um, over the period of her husband's absence. Then we want to start unpacking the image for ourselves. So let's just think about gates. Well, when open, gates can let someone in or let someone out. When closed, they can keep someone in or keep someone out. Um, so literally, that's what gates do. We, of course, want to be aware of what gates are in the real world. But we also think about associations that are that we might draw from gates. I mean, of course, the idea of openness versus closeness, being open to others, being closed to others, isolated, being kept in versus being allowed to go out, uh, welcoming, letting someone in versus being trapped, uh, being keeping someone out, uh, repulsing someone, repelling someone, and ideas of leaving home, coming home, returning home, um, and all of these we can see are important associations that resonate with the poem. Now we can start getting into some more specifics in our process of unpacking, of analyzing. I played about the front gate. Well, it's the front of the house. So this is what's facing out to the world. Um, about the front gate. Is she inside or outside or is she in between? And of course, playing, playfulness, that this is a childhood setting. So we have that theme, that 
atmosphere of playfulness. So again, some associations or ideas. Uh, this idea of the child coming into the world open to new experiences, as we are when we're children, and emerging from the home. And her in-between status, right? She's Is she inside or outside of the gate? She's growing up, but she's not an adult yet. She's still a child. So she's And she's sort of maybe at this in-between stage, between childhood and maturity, not in the womb, no longer protected by her parents, but perhaps not ready to go out completely on her own. And as we know from the poem, she's on the cusp of marriage. In the next stanza, she'll get married. And so the gate is the meeting place. It's where the private world ends and the public world begins, where she goes from one stage to another stage, one place to another place. Looking at the second quotation, by the gate now, the moss is grown, the different mosses too deep to clear them away. So now tells us that this is set in the present, not the past. Moss has grown slowly to cover the gate. And this idea of too deep, is the gate closed? Can it be reopened? The sense of something that cannot be undone. So thinking about our associations, what's evoked? What ideas can we get from this? Well, the sense of the moss and the passage of time, this slow creeping growth of moss, suggests that a long time has passed, at least from her perspective. And again, this idea of the impossibility of returning to the past. Things are too deep. There's a sense, suggestion of her sadness or fear over loss, that exclamation point, as well as the repetition. And, of course, what was open is now closed. Something has changed. There's been a turning point. Things are no longer the way they were. So these are all ideas that we can get just from looking at and examining the language in the context of when these lines occur in the poem. And as we're doing this unpacking, we're also thinking about the effects of the language and the actions that we see, um, the symbolic actions, the virtual actions that we see the language performing. So some questions to ask, um, how do the images work individually? We've already started to talk about that a little bit. What do they reveal about the speaker's thoughts, desires, etc.? We've started to address that a little bit. How do they work to communicate the speaker's intended or unintended, perhaps unconscious, messages to the addressee? And finally, how do the images work when considered together? So again, returning to that first line I played about the front gate. So here the speaker remembers the first meeting with her husband, but she also reminds her husband of that meeting. Meeting, She's telling him about it. And she's creating an atmosphere of playfulness, innocence, openness, as we've discussed all these ideas that are associated with the gate and playfulness. And she provides context for her letter, for her message, by showing where their relationship started. So this serves as the starting point for everything that comes afterwards. This is what everything unfolds from. And it suggests a fondness for the past memory, that she has a nostalgic or warm feeling. So these are some of the actions, effects that are produced by these lines. Looking at the second quotation, by the gate now the moss has grown, etc. So here the speaker remarks on the effects of the passage of time, but remarks is a pretty neutral verb that sounds like she doesn't have any opinion on it. Uh, so perhaps we might say laments, because there's a sense of sadness here. Um, and she's informing her husband about what has happened in his absence, but again, informing sounds very neutral, so we might say something like warns her husband. Not in the sense of a threatening warn, but saying these things have happened. I just want you to know you should, you should be aware that these potentially bad things have happened. And as opposed to the atmosphere of playfulness and innocence, etc., of the first quotation, this one creates an atmosphere of loss, sadness, stagnation, the idea of the mosses growing and covering over this, this gate. So it's a very different atmosphere. And thus it transforms the context of the letter by showing the current situation of their relationship. So it's the counterpoint to what she had begun the letter with. And finally, we could say it suggests her sadness over her husband's absence and 
the fear of loss that she might ex be experiencing because of his absence. So now let's juxtapose these two pieces of evidence, these two quotations. That is, put them side by side and see how they work together. So when we go from the front gate to the gate now, we see that the wife goes from remembering the playfulness of their first meeting to lamenting his present absence. So it's a change in what she's doing, a change in her actions, change in what she is saying to him. And it shows how the passage of time has shaped their relationship in positive ways, certainly, because it's through the passage of time that their love has grown more deep, more intense. But also the passage of time now perhaps threatens their relationship because of his absence. And she shows, although indirectly, the depths of her feelings for her husband and, again, her fear, anxiety over his absence. She's showing just how much she cares about him, even though she's not saying it expressly. And this also shows or suggests a desire to return to the past, that warmth that she feels with the past. So she wants to recover some of that, but also her recognition that such a return is impossible, ultimately. That they cannot go back, but they can go forward. Now that we've developed these ideas, we can start to put them on paper. And so I'm saying we're writing from the middle because we're beginning with the evidence itself. And that's usually not going to be the first thing in a paragraph, or at least it usually should not be the first thing in the paragraph. It's actually going to come more towards the middle of a paragraph. But let's begin with the evidence and the context in order to sh give shape to the paragraph that we're trying to write. So beginning with the evidence in the context, we might say something like, twice in the poem, the speaker refers to the gate of her home as a sign of her relationship with her husband. So that provides the overall context and it gives a suggestion of our interpretation. Uh, and then a couple of lines that each provide the specific context for each quotation and include the essential language from the text that you want to cite. At the beginning of her letter, she recalls how as a child she met her husband while she, quote, played about the front gate pulling flowers. She mentions the gate again near the end, telling her husband that, quote, the moss is grown, end quote, over the gate, and that it is, quote, too deep to clear them away. So both of those, again, provide some context, tell us, they don't just say she says blank, but they say why she is saying those words, why, what's the situation in which these lines occur and it provides the specific language that we need. Moss, growth, gate, deep, play, etc. Now that we've got our illustration, we can start explaining it. Um, and this is where we unpack the most important ideas that we've developed. Now, you're not going to necessarily put in everything that you've thought of related to the image of Gates or these particular lines. It depends, again, on the specific points you're trying to make. Um, so some of these ideas might come up in other paragraphs, in other sections of the paper. Uh, but let's unpack the ideas that we've developed. So we can say, the gate serves as an important symbol of the connection between the speaker and her husband. Gates function to protect and contain, but also to let in or out. So we're giving some general ideas about the image and what it means and how it, again, sets up some context for us understanding the relationship. And we could go on a little bit, another sentence or two perhaps, if we wanted to further explain this idea of gates and how they serve as a general symbol of the relationship. And then we move into explaining the first quotation. The speaker first met her husband at the gate to her home, representing how she was beginning to leave the protection of her childhood home to, en to enter the outside world as an adult. And we could carry on with that. We could talk. We could unpack if we wanted the idea of the front of the house. We could talk about the playfulness, etc., etc. Um, but that's uh, an explanation of the first citation. Carrying on, after we've discussed that first image, we would say something like, in contrast to the open gate where she played with her future husband, quote, the gate now, end quote, has been overgrown by moss, suggesting how the passage of time has transformed their relationship. So here I'm explicating the relationship between the two images and unpacking that idea of moss and so forth. And notice how I began the sentence with in contrast. So that very clearly sets up the relationship between this quotation and the other quotation, as opposed to just saying 
she says here that the gate was at the front, that she played by it, and then she says that the gate had moss on it. That's just telling me what's in the poem. By putting that in contrast, it suggests the relationship between the, the images. After we've discussed a little bit that relationship, we can go on. Rather than a warm recollection of their past, the image of the gate now serves as a sign of the decay in their relationship, something that has happened slowly, almost imperceptibly, just as how moss grows slowly. And again, discussing that significance of the imagery, we could go on for another sentence or two to unpack other details that might be important for our overall analysis. Now, part of the explanation, of course, is then to connect it to our overall thesis, whatever our overall interpretation of the poem is that you're trying to advance. Now, I know we've sort of skipped that step. We've gone straight to the analysis. We haven't talked about whatever the overall thesis that we're trying to prove about this poem is, but that's just for the purposes of this illustration. We talk about forming theses, the theses in a different um, lecture. But for our purposes here, let's assume that we have some thesis already that we're trying to put forward, as I've suggested in this passage. So connecting what we've already unpacked, these ideas about the gates, their contrast, the different ideas that they express, what does that tell us about what the poem means, what the speaker is trying to do? So here's one thing that we, one way that we might write this. The contrast between the two images of the gate which we've discussed, and the speaker's use of an exclamation point to express heightened emotion in the second mention suggests that the speaker's sense of loss and her suggests the speaker's sense of loss and her fear over the decay of her relationship. By repeating the earlier image in a radically transformed context, the speaker communicates to her husband her fears and perhaps even warns him that time is running out on their marriage and that he needs to return soon in order to prevent it from falling apart completely. So I've connected the ideas about these particular examples in the text to an overall idea about what the poem means and what the speaker is attempting to accomplish. And again, this is just one sample thesis. This could be this same evidence could be used to uh, make a different argument, a very radically different argument. This is just one interpretation through the reading that I've led us through. Now we've talked about the illustration and we've talked about the explanation, but we haven't talked about the first part of the paragraph, the point. So crafting a topic sentence, and this is where you express the point of the paragraph. What's the idea you're trying to prove? What is the action that you're describing or analyzing? And this is not going to be similar to your explanation at the end of the paragraph, but it's going to be slightly more abstract, more general. So this is what we might, this is how we might express the point we're trying to prove through these ideas that we're unpacking through the analysis that we've performed so far. The speaker wishes to communicate to her husband not only her romantic feelings towards him, but also her strong desire for him to return home. However, she rarely expresses herself directly, instead using the real objects of their everyday experience as symbols of her thoughts and feelings. So I've identified the speaker's basic actions. I've put them in the context of the overall goal or thesis, my overall argument, and providing some context for the specific evidence that you plan to use. And notice how this um, addresses some of the ideas that we've unpacked, but in a more general way. And it gives us, again, an introduction to the specific textual evidence that we're going to use. So now we're at the point where we can put it all together. And what I've done here is I've put all the things that we've written in an order that goes point, illustration, explanation, and I've made the text colors different, the font colors different. So the purple is the point, the black in the center is the illustration, the red is the explanation. So we announce the idea that we're trying to explore the idea of the, the speaker's communication to her husband and how she wants him to return and how she uses these other objects as symbols to express herself. That's our point. Then we get into the illustration of that point where we look at specific textual evidence and unpack it, explain the context, etc., etc., and the ideas that are evoked. 
and go through that in some detail. And that's in our black type. And then finally, in red type, we have the explanation where we connect the ideas that we've developed to our overall thesis. Now, you'll note that this is somewhat long, and there's even places where there could be more information added. So I've broken this up into two paragraphs. Now, as a whole, they go through point, illustration, explanation. Um, we don't have a new point illustration and explanation for the second paragraph. And that's fine because these are all addressing the same idea. Uh, sometimes uh, you'll need just one paragraph to address a point, but sometimes when you're using complicated ideas, here since we have two different pieces of evidence that are supporting the same idea, it makes sense to divide it into two paragraphs to make it easier to read and to show that there's a clear distinction between the two pieces of evidence, but that they're connected by their ideas. So to review, remember that our paragraphs, or it could be a section that includes multiple paragraphs, if it's all about the same idea, should be structured basically to have a point, an illustration of that point, and then an explanation of how the illustration works. An idea that you're trying to prove the concrete evidence of that idea in action, and an explanation of how the concrete evidence supports the idea. Another way to think about this is we go from abstract to concrete to abstract. Abstract meaning we're talking about ideas, themes. Concrete meaning we're talking about specific things. So we have our general idea that we want to prove. We have the concrete image from the text, the language from the text that we use to prove it, and then we have the abstract ideas that explain the meaning behind those or the meanings created, suggested by that concrete evidence. So ideas to specific evidence in the text, back to ideas. The importance of context whenever you're talking about any quotation, any moment in a literary text, you want to make sure you explain where it comes from and the situation rather than just dumping it in the page. Making sure to unpack the language, going into detail as to the associations, ideas, connotations, all the things that are evoked by the language, and in particular by the language in, con in connection as the different words and phrases work together and resonate and reflect with each other. And finally, your individual analysis, that is the analysis of an individual moment in the text, should work to support your overall interpretation of the, the poem or play or whatever it is that you're interpreting. So those moments, the details that you're looking at, any particular image, figure of speech, whatever, that should be connected to your grand thesis, the interpretation that you're trying to prove as a whole.